Hello, everyone. Hello. Um, if I haven't gotten the chance to meet you, my name is Emerald, and I'm really glad you're here. If you're watching online, thank you so much, um, Emerald and band. Um, what a gift! What a gift we have, like to be a part of of this community and a part of listening and just. I don't know if you ever understand why we do what we do, but a lot of times the songs that we choose here at East Town are kind of just to set the tone for the day. Like this is what we're doing, this is where we're going. Um, with all life's distractions, everything that's weighing heavy on your heart this morning, um, hopefully you can connect. Uh, when you walk into this room, you can connect with the message of the song. Um, if you've grown up in church, you've grown up in a tradition that is pretty liturgical or pretty high church, it's like, why are they doing a John Mayer song, right? It's like, one of the things that we really believe about artists in our world is that they still have a gift. And if they're not pointing to God for their gift, we'll take it and we'll do that. We'll actually help them do that. And so that's what we're doing today. And I'm just so thankful for Emerald and our band. Um, again, I wanna just welcome you here. Uh, welcome those who are watching online today. Uh, my name is Clint Dupin. If this is your first time at East Town or you've been coming for a few weeks, uh, we are so thankful that you are here. Um, if you haven't checked in with us, you can check in right now. You can simply text East Town to 94000. Also, there's a card on your chair for those of you that are actually in the room. Um, you can fill out, and there is a little box. It's called the Generosity Box. You can just simply drop it in that box on your way out of uh, the gathering today. And we would love to connect with you because I know this, um, this world is hard to navigate alone and we want to encourage you. We want to continue to help you. Um, I know for me, this community is huge. And one of the things I used to always say when we were just solely online during the pandemic, I would say, man, I can't wait to be back in person because what's happening in the room is a lot better than what's happening out there. I mean, you think about the things that you engage with, like if you're watching online, um, that's awesome, and we love that. Uh, but what I think is so special and beautiful about East Town is the community. And that's where like we start feeling um, where we start feeling connected. Hey, if you are in the um, if you're in uh, actually the courtyard, I'm going to invite you to go ahead and come on in. We're going to close the coffee down. We're going to get started right now because today I, I want to try to do as much as I can to eliminate distractions. Um, because I know that today's topic is a topic that we've actually never uh, breached here at East Town. We're going to talk about something that we might have, we might have like kind of skimmed the surface, but we've never really dove into the whole idea of spiritual warfare. Is it real? Is it true? You know, actually, is it, is it something that's kind of made up or actually does it really, really exist? So last week, we talked about the four lies that we often believe and live out. If you missed last week, you can watch online. You can go back and you watch online. You can listen to our podcast. Uh, Hosanna Wong um, presented the message. It was absolutely incredible. We had tons of great feedback for that. And it kind of leads into today. So I would encourage you to go backwards, watch that. And then next week, we're going to talk about strategies um, what are the strategies to face some of the things that we're going to talk about today? So you're not going to want to miss that as, as well. So where do those lies come from? What plants those there? We talk often about the enemy that comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. It's not enough for the enemy just to steal. It's not enough for them to just kill it, but it's also we want to destroy it. Now, it's not always physical death. It's like they wanted, they, uh, the enemy wants to heap shame and discouragement, keep throwing your past in your face. It's not enough just to say, hey, you know what? That's good. That's bad. We're going to move on. They're going to keep it in front of us. But is that real? Could it be true that there is a real enemy out there named the devil or Satan? Now think about movies over the past years that we have watched or we've seen, maybe you never watched these, that we've been fascinated by. You think about paranormal activity, right? That you, maybe you don't remember this movie, but we watch what appears to be real footage of a couple who thinks they have a demon haunting their house. Or maybe you grew up watching, it's a great bedtime movie, maybe some of you watched The Exorcism. 
Like, hey, come on in, kids. We're going to watch this. Watch this head spin around. It's a really cool feature they put on here. But maybe for some of us, it's like, that's what we watch. You're like, could this actually be true? Could this actually happen to me today? I remember watching, I'm going to date myself right now, uh, Blair Witch. Does anybody remember Blair Witch? Like Blair Witch, good Lord, nothing scared me more. I couldn't go to sleep for days. Nothing actually happened. The dog did die at the end. That was old yeller. But anyways, it's like, you remember, if you remember some of these movies, it's like, it's just like, it, could this actually happen? Could this be real? So today we want to open the scripture and ask a few questions. Is this real? Is this the reason I have so much pain? Could it be the reason I have so much difficulty in my life? Are the lies, the negative thoughts, the mental battles I face, are they actually planted there by the devil? And if the enemy is real, what does that mean for my life? And how do I fight against it? Now, for those of you who would be in here and you would say, I'm kind of on this journey. I'm on a spiritual quest. Maybe some of the stuff that I mentioned today, you're like, wow, that's kind of freaky or that's kind of weird. That's okay. Totally fine. But maybe just kind of take the posture of listening and say, man, I can relate. There has been a lot of unexplained things that have happened in my life over and over and over. Could there actually be another world could there actually be something else going on? So in talking about the devil, there are two mistakes we tend to make. If you want to take notes, um, I would encourage you to do that on your phone. Uh, if you have a piece of paper, whatever, I don't know, whatever you want to use. But I think I'm going to share some truths today that could really benefit you when it comes to fighting and engaging in this battle. So the two mistakes we tend to make. Some of us have thought Satan is everywhere. Right? We kind of just say, well, you know, Satan made me do it. You know, I got, in a, I, I got caught for speeding. That was Satan, right? It's like, no, maybe you're going too fast. I flunked my test. Satan made me flunk. No, maybe you just didn't study. I tried that one a lot in high school. It just didn't work, right? It's like, maybe there are so many different things that you do that you just kind of give it to Satan. Like, well, Satan actually did that, right? It's like, maybe for some of you, you thought that the enemy sided with the Sacramento Kings the other night. Okay, inappropriate in church. But anyways, right? And then maybe, right, Dan? But anyways, maybe you have thought that Satan is nowhere. I, had, I just don't believe it. Like, I, I don't really believe that Satan is a presence. I don't believe he's a spirit. I don't believe it's an enemy. I don't believe that it exists. There can also be this underemphasis that seems to be the most common. This is easy to do because we make so many, I mean, you've heard me make even jokes about this sometimes, right? You watch movies, you see, I don't know if you grew up on Saturday Night Live, but Saturday Night Live, this is going to shock you, it used to be good. But anyways, Saturday Night Live, like if you remember the old episode of Garth Brooks and Will Ferrell, where Garth Brooks sold his soul to the devil, which was Will Ferrell for a tasty lick, right? It's like, Nobody's with me? Yeah, because that was in 1952. But anyways, right, it's like we see things like that, and we're like, man, maybe that's not real. We've kind of chalked the devil up to, you know, he's got red horns, and he's got a pitchfork, and that's not real. But maybe Satan has become more of a made-up, fictitious character that is not real to you. And maybe it feels easier to joke about it than consider an actual presence in the spiritual world that is fighting against God in our lives. Now, here's why this is so important for us to take seriously. Have you ever thought about why you can't break that habit? Have you ever thought, why do you struggle to connect with the creator of the universe? Have you ever wondered why you are just driven to make bad decisions? You want to do the right thing, but you just continue to have this inner struggle, this inner battle, and you give in to those bad decisions. You ever wonder why your kids or friends appear to have just this cloud of darkness around them? It's like, there's something happening here. There's something in this group where I feel this, this way. I don't know how to define it. Many times it is directly related to what is going on in the spirit world. And so today we're going to talk about that spiritual world. And if there is a spiritual world, we also are going to look at spiritual warfare. The battle between sin and evil from Satan and the goodness, beauty and life that God created us 
4. And we're going to look at the book of Ephesians. We're going to focus on Ephesians chapter 6. But before we dive into that, I'm going to give you a few observations. Actually, we're going to dive through it all the way through, so that's not true. I want to give you a few observations. Let me do this. Let me pray before we get started. Lord, we just come to you in this moment. And God, I just pray against any distraction. Lord, I just pray that you will help us focus, that we will center our minds and our hearts on what is true. In your name, amen. The first observation is this. There is a physical world and there is a spiritual world. So I want to look at Ephesians chapter uh, 6, and we're going to start in verse 10. And this is what Paul is saying, and Paul is in prison as he's writing this, and he's writing it to a group of people um, in Ephesus. And so something was happening in this community. Something was happening in the surrounding community as well. well. He says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. So think about it. If he's in prison, he's in a Roman prison, and he's watching these centurions, he's watching these soldiers, he's noticing the armor that they're putting on. He notices what they're wearing, so he kind of uses this analogy to help us. He says, for we are fighting against flesh and blood. We are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against the evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in this heavenly place. Um, My grandfather and my grandmother uh, were in, in ministry. They were evangelists and they would travel around and they would speak at all different places uh, in the U.S., in Russia, in Haiti, all different places. And there was a few times that I would actually spend the night at my grandparents' house. And I would be up early and I would pass the room and I would look in their room and I would see my grandfather on this side of the bed and I would see outside, not in the bed, they were outside on the floor in the bed, you know, outside the bed. I'm really having a hard time. And then my grandmother was over here and they were going through these motions. And I'm like, man, they have lost it. Something is wrong. And I remember asking, I, well, in the South, I grew up in North Carolina, and then moved to Detroit. But anyways, I asked my granny, we called him granny, okay, get over it. I called him, I, I, said, my, I said, granny, what are you guys doing? She goes, oh, every single morning, and to this day, my grandparents are still alive. To this day, we get up and we put on the armor that Paul talks about in Ephesians. I'm like, oh, you're nuts, right? It's like, what? And I didn't understand it at the time. I didn't realize how important it was. But what, I, what, what sticks with me is how true the enemy was in their, in, 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 their, in their living, in their lifestyle, that they realized this is real. And it says, the author, uh, the guy named Paul, he says, he calls us to understand some things. The first one is this, be aware of spiritual battles. There's a physical world and a spiritual world. Live with the awareness of the spiritual world. Maybe some of you, um, you, if you ever got into the the series called Stranger Things, right? I really got into it with my daughter, Claire. We love Stranger Things. And it was this group of people living in reality in this one world, but they could sense that something else was what's going on in this world. There was the, they called it the upside down. And so it began, and if you remember, if you didn't watch this, but what begins to happen is the upside down begins to enter into reality. And there's this war at hand. There is this battle at hand. This is kind of a glimpse. This is a great picture of spiritual warfare. There's this spiritual war. And then the second thing is this, spiritual battles cannot be won by physical means. Spiritual battles cannot be won by physical means. Listen to what Paul says to the Corinth people. He says, for, through, uh, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons that we fight with are not weapons of the world. In some cases, right, in some cases when something tragic ha- happens, we do physical things correct? So if something bad happens to a loved one, or if they're going through sickness or illness, what do we do? We bring food, we send cards, we help out. And if this, and this helps, right? But there is a cloud of depression that kind of lingers. And often we know the person needs something beyond the physical. 
So what do we say? We send a card. Or what do we do? We send a card with an inspirational thought. And we tell them, you are in my thoughts. We use phrases like, thinking good thoughts for you or sending positive energy your way. There's something that when we stop people and say, can I pray for you? Or we have a conversation on the phone and we say, hey, can I just say a quick prayer for you? Or can I, I'm just, I'm just, I'm hoping you find hope. And you know, you're acknowledging that there's more that's going on behind the scene. Maybe you have been through something that made your eyes open to the fact that there was something more going on, the possibility of a spiritual realm. I remember I was around 11 years of age and my dad was a pastor and I remember he would come and tell me certain stories, but he would be kind of vague, and I didn't really understand what was going on. And I remember one day my dad rushes out the door, and he goes to visit uh, this person, and he was going to pray for them. And I remember I walked up to the room, and I pushed the answer machine, and I heard the message that alerted him to actually leave the house and go pray for this group of people. And what I heard on the phone deeply, deeply disturbed me, and I was very fearful and I knew the people, I knew the person that was actually leaving the message and then their spouse in the background saying things that I couldn't even recognize the voice. And I remember asking my dad as an 11-year-old, I'm like, Dad, what, is, what, what was that? He's like, first of all, you shouldn't be in my room. Some of you don't even know what an answer machine is. But anyways, touching an answer machine and playing it, that's my business. He said, but I actually had to go over and pray over this person because they were demonically possessed. I'm like, is that true? Does that happen? And maybe you've never experienced anything like that, but you've actually felt it or you've sensed it. So there's this physical world and a spiritual world. Paul's reminding us that not all battles are physical, but be aware of the spiritual ones. And he's also saying the second thing is this, be familiar with Satan's strategies. Let me just say that again. If all you get today is this, is be familiar with Satan's strategies. Like this, this is so important. There is an unseen enemy that wants to take you down. I really firmly believe that. He knows who you are and he has strategies against you. And I want you to write these down, take a picture of them, whatever you want to do. But I want you to remember these because here's what I believe that he does. He wants to kill your platform. He wants to disqualify you. He wants to kill your platform. I see this with many of my friends. Is that especially ones that are in ministry. The enemy will do all it can to destroy their platform. Sin. You think about shame. Insecurity. If you have a bad reputation, no one will listen to you. The enemy knows this. It's like, if I can get you to morally fail, if I can get you to be deceitful, no one's going to listen to you anymore. Try to share Jesus with someone that has just saw your browser history or your outburst of anger. If you have a bad reputation, no one will listen to you. The enemy knows this. This is a strategy. This is a tactic. The second one is he will steal, the enemy will steal your passion. Do everything to discourage you. You are nothing. Church doesn't work. Why are you wasting your time on Sunday morning? Why are you wasting your time with that community? You're right. I need to be in Tahoe. I want to actually go to Tahoe. Right? I want to do this. It's like just the little seeds of doubt. You can't do this. Someone else has way more influence than you. And then apathy and laziness and discouragement, insecurity. You give your affection to other things so that your affection for things of God begins to dim diminish. For some of you, this is just a, maybe a smaller group of you. For those of you who can remember when you first trusted Jesus, uh, where you, you first put your faith in Jesus, how excited you were. And now it's just kind of a check mark, right? It can kind of become just a check mark. It's like, I better do it so I don't go to hell. I want to go to heaven. Yep, I'm there, right? It's like you've lost your passion. He's robbed it of you. The enemy comes to steal your passion. Ever meet anyone that their passion for God has grown cold? And the third one that he uses, his third strategy is destroy your purpose. Will distract you 
if at all possible. Better get busy building your career. You can come back to the God thing later. Get distracted with addictions, bad habits, relationships. This is one that I know in the Bay Area that is so tempting. Build your castle, not God's kingdom. Build your thing. You, 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 I'll come back to this part later. Clint, you just don't understand. I'm so busy right now. I'll get to this later. I'm going to focus on my, my career this season. I'm just going to focus on my kids this season, and then everything will actually be okay. When there's great fruit in your life, stay alert. He finds the person to bring disunity. One of the things that Michael and I often talked about, if we feel like something amazing has happened in our life, if we feel like God actually showed up and answered something, we know that the enemy is very close behind. We know that there will be discouragement, there will be temptation, there will be shame, there will be certain things that just come rushing in. When lives are being changed, he is looking for someone to stir up gossip into the body. When the message of Jesus is about to be proclaimed, stay alert, right? There's temptations, there's anger, Here's the truth about this. There's a very real battle going on right now between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. And you know what they are fighting over. It's you. You think about, I shared this with our leadership huddle this morning. It's like, anytime there's a battle, it's over real estate. It's over geography most of the time, right? The geography in this case is your soul, is your heart, I, maybe for some of you, you deal with shame and guilt. Could there be an enemy that is doing that to you? Because God is not a God of shame. God is not a God of condemnation. Condemnation actually pushes us away from the heart of Jesus. Conviction actually draws us closer. He is not about condemnation. There is no condemnation in Christ. If you're feeling con condemned, or if you're feeling the shame and the guilt, could it be the enemy is at hand? Your heart and your soul are the real estate in this battle. Third thing I want to talk about is be skilled with spiritual weapons. Be skilled with spiritual weapons. So how do we battle against this? How do we fight against it? This is what many refer to as spiritual warfare. And I think sometimes uh, we think, I think, um, that we are all self-aware and smart enough to recognize when we are being influenced by forces outside of a larger, that are larger than ourselves. I know I do, because I'm an idiot. And God has placed Michael in my life to remind me that I'm an idiot. Well, that's one of the many reasons. It's like, no, are you serious? You really think that about that person? You really feel that way? Is that something that you think that, that God's breathing into you right now? Um, I don't know if, if any of you saw the, the children's movie, The Lord of the Rings. That's a bad church joke. But anyways, Lord of the Rings, and I said this before because it was such a great movie, they decided to write books about it. It was amazing. But anyways, I don't know if we have, do we have those pictures, Adnan? We don't have it. That's an X. Okay, that means no. So anyways, uh, if you remember, if you ever saw Lord of the Rings, there is King Rohan. And he's over this vast valley and in, in this vast amount of land. And uh, Aragorn, I do sound like a nerd right now. I sound like Dwight Schrute. But anyways, Aragorn and, uh, Aragorn and Gandalf actually go visit Rohan, King Rohan. Well, then when they walk into his palace, they immediately felt a darkness. And you see this. This is beautifully uh, portrayed by Tolkien. And they're seeing what's happening to Rohan. And, and Rohan in the day was this mighty warrior, this mighty king, spoke truth. But then something creeped in. This advisor creeped into his life and just began to whisper little seeds of doubt and lies. And over time, I wish you could see this picture. Over time, he went from this mighty king to kind of this deranged, like overtaken, just weak and could barely speak. And it's this beautiful thing that begins to happen. Gandalf, the white, begins to speak truth, begins to aim the truth at the darkness. And this character who was playing the role of the dark 
um, uh, disgusting influence in King Rohan's life, didn't know what to do with it, and had to flee for its life because truth is what set Rohan free. This is what begins to happen. There's this spiritual battle. And for some of us, we are so engulfed with lies about ourselves, we don't even know where it started. But when you start hearing the truth of God, it will set you free. Rich Viotis says this, We might think we are strong enough to resist any outside influence. And that sense of insight and strength is exactly the problem. We are more vulnerable and exposed than we think. Paul is writing this in prison. He's dealing with real spiritual battles, and he begins to unfold this. Listen to Ephesians 6, verse 10 through 18. I'm just going to kind of tear this apart, so just follow along with me. He says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. He says, you are not strong. And what is he saying? You are not strong enough to win this battle in your own power. You don't have enough strength. You can't do it on your own. So what does he say? Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. What is he talking about? Any good force has multiple strategies. Anything that's strong and overpowering has multiple strategies. They just don't show up to battle. They don't show up to a game with only one strategy. If this isn't working, we're going to try this. If this isn't working, we're going to try this. The last dance series about Michael Jordan is one of my favorite docuseries. Because why? Because Michael Jordan was the greatest player of all time. I don't care what you say. But anyways, right? It's like, it's beautiful. One of the things that one of the coaches talks about, he's like, if you show up with one strategy against Michael Jordan, you will lose. You actually had to have multiple strategies in order to beat this guy. The enemy is the same way. It will try one thing. And if that doesn't work, it will go to another. It will try to discourage you. And this is what Paul's saying. You learn to use some spiritual weapons in your life. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. Right? It's not against people. Right? Not all of your struggles are mental or psychological, relational, physical. The Bible says, but instead against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in a heavenly place. Places. Do we have that on there? Is that following me? It's not following me. Adnan, can you put those, can you make sure that those scriptures are on there? I hate to call you out, buddy. I apologize. All right. Are we there? All right. Good. So what is he saying? What's he talking about here? If you have a battle, your battle's not necessarily against other people. What is he talking about? This is what Rich Velotis says. He says, he defines power as powers and principalities are spiritual forces that become hostile, take root in individuals, ideologies, and institutions with the goal of deception, division, and uh, depersonalization. This is huge right? This is something that is so big, is that the enemy knows how to take things that are good, pervert them, and change them. Their intentions are not always evil, but become used in an evil way because of human idolatry. One day, they will fully be subjective to God's rule. They show up in all different places. Here is a short list. I want to give you a short list of where we see these principalities take place. We see it in government. We see it in political leaders. We see it in corporations. We see it in churches. We see it in denominations. We see it in educational institutions. We see it in cities and nations. This is what begins to happen. So when we deny that these forces are even real, they continue to wreak havoc all around us. Like, think about that. Think what the enemy will do. It's like, no, there's not, there's not systematic racism. There's individual cases, right? And so when we deny that these forces are even real, we can't handle it. We are actually getting beat. So when we deny it, these forces are real. They continue to wreak havoc all around us. Systematic racism, injustice, personal battles. But here's the great thing is that Christ died to defeat all of these. Rich Velotis says these powers 
have one aim, to survive. They will do all they can to survive. They will take on different looks and forms. Rich says the way powers do this is to have us live deceptive lives by convincing us to orient our lives around certain values. And often these values, you'll hear me say this quite often, they start out as good, at least at the beginning, until they dominate us into such a degree that we can achieve them only through deceit. And where is the deceit? We deceive ourselves. There will be a day I'll have more time. The reason I have to cut this corner is because I need to get to this part. Of my, I need to get to this stage of my career. We begin to deceive ourselves because something that started out as good has taken on a completely different form and it's taken over our life. Productivity, efficiency, performance, all good values. Nothing wrong with them. If allowed, they will take over our lives and grow beyond healthy boundaries, and it becomes impossible to live them out without deception to ourselves. Let me continue on in the scripture. Therefore, do we have that one? Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so that you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will be standing firm. In other terms, there's actually a way to stand firm. There's a way not to be a victim to the enemy. Now he's going to tell us just how to do that. He says this, stand your ground. And he tells us to put on, let's go to the next scripture. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth. Do we have that one? Putting on the belt of truth. So he says, you have to know the truth. The belt of truth actually sets you free. One of the things I love that we do here at Easttown is Alpha. Like if you really are on this spiritual journey, you have these huge spiritual and life questions. Like what is truth? Like Alpha is a place to start. The enemy will lie to you and tell you that you're worthless. The truth says that God loves you. You have to know the truth. Rich Velota says that failure to be true is also what separates us from love. Satan is actually named in scripture as the father of lies. Deception is his primary strategy. Think about those of you who are raising teenagers right now. Think of, the, remember when you were a teenager. I, I just feel like the enemy does all, like it is on full time, right? It's like, it's on overtime to convince you that you are not good enough. That you don't have as great of friends as you should have, that you are not able to do the things that you should be able to do, that you don't look the way that you should look. And that begins to be imprinted in our soul and we carry that for the rest of time. Think about it. You don't have to be religious to know lying is wrong. It is, it is, recognizable. It is a recognizable sin across the board and is a major character flaw. So when he's speaking about truth, we know what truth is, but soon we begin to distance ourselves from it. We are told to tell the truth from childhood. It's a virtue. When we lie enough to others and ourselves, Rich says this, we begin to believe our falsehoods. We find ourselves creating a reality inconsistent with the truth and trying to inhabit it. Given enough time, we will eventually become our lie. John Mark Comer says, our fight with the devil is first and foremost a fight to take back control of our minds from their captivity to lies and liberate them from the weapon of truth. We are able to expose the powers of control in our lives when we speak truth. It reveals what is really going on. This is what it was so amazing, what Dr. King did in the civil rights movement. He was able to expose the triple evils, the racism, the economic exploitation and militarism. He was able to expose their strategies by speaking the truth about them. In naming the powers, we are able to expose the truth about them. I just think about one of the things, and I know I, I kind of get on this all the time, but 
a little dangerous thing that we carry around with us that's made of glass and technology. I call it the phone. And it's amazing what happens to it. And, and we can use it for good or it can become a source of dishonesty. And what we begin to see that happens, it blinds us to different things that, are, that God actually wants us to know in our life. And you think about certain things when we put it into the hands of our children, and I say children, and when we, we, we put this in, and at, first time, at, at the beginning, it's for something that's good, but before long, it starts to share lies about how we look, we follow social media, we're on TikTok, we're on all these different things, and it begins to say, I'm just not enough. And we start believing these lies about ourselves. And we don't really know what truth is anymore. And we can all become blind to areas of spiritual bondage. And we get used to it. We go back to the scripture. He says this, in the body of armor of God's righteousness. What is righteousness? It's to be in a right relationship with God. It doesn't mean you have to be perfect. It means you are forgiven. You've turned from those powers that are so divisive to the things that unify. Righteousness can actually be interchanged with the word justice. These are characteristics of those who are in Christ. When you say that I am a Christ follower, wherever you go, you're bringing justice. Wherever you go, it's not just to an individual. It could be to a social structure. It could be to to any type of system around. It's like, hey, I'm bringing, when I'm living in the truth of God, I know who I am. I'm able to see when people are oppressed. I'm able to see when people are marginalized. I'm able to see systems that are perverse. And I'm able to speak into it and speak truth. And it says, for, for shoes, put on the peace. This is the next part of the scripture. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. Don't settle for a life without peace. Chase, I'm going to invite you up. I want us to engage. I, I, I want you to push out. If you're distracted right now, I want you to engage in this last few moments here. Because I think this is really, really important for us. Because as soon as you walk out those doors, I always say this to our team, but when you walk out, there, things feel good right now. But I believe the enemy is out there doing push-ups. And it's going to come at you full force. And it's going to say, hey, you're hungry. You know what? We'll, talk, we'll discuss that later. Think about that later. What you felt in there, that wasn't real. That wasn't real. Like, you don't need that in your life right now. You, you know what? You can actually deal with that later. You can deal with that later. Is that truth? Do I know how to call what it is? Do I know how to call it out? How we treat and speak of other people. Is it true? Are we fully coming prepared? Do we bring peace and hope wherever we go? Peace comes from when we are surrendered to God's way, the way of Jesus, following him, not following our desires. We live in a fragmented world. When we are in Christ, we become vehicles of shalom. We become vehicles of peace, of wholeness, because we live in such a broken world. How we treat and speak of all people groups. How we love and respect the LGBTQ community. How we speak of those in power and leadership. How we speak of those on the right and how we speak of those on the left. Is it about wholeness? Is it about unity? If our words and actions are not bringing human flourishing, we are not walking in the shoes of the gospel. Man. That'll preach. That dog will hunt. I think this is so important. Maybe for some of us, as you've gotten so used to looking at the negative, you've gotten so used to showing up to a situation and speaking bitterness. You've gotten so used to just marginalizing a people group, a lifestyle, or whatever. Is that Jesus? Is it human flourishing? Because if it's not, we need to repent. If it's not, we need to go back and make restitution. If it's not, it's like, no, 
you know what? That isn't true. I have drifted and there is no condemnation. There is conviction and it's like drawing you back to the heart because when you are, are seeing things and there's hope and there's a light at the end of the tunnel, it's like no matter how bad the storm is, it's like you can still have hope and you can still experience peace. That's when you know that you're fighting the battle. That's when you know that you have showed up and you're fighting the battle. In addition to all of these, he says, in addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Think about all the things we're hit with during the day. You're nothing. You're pathetic. You need this to experience happiness. You could never make a difference. Jesus says, he gives us promises. He says that greater is the one who lives inside of me than the one who lives in the world. By faith, we open space for the Spirit to form in our lives. And he says, put on the salvation as your helmet. What does he mean? The center of your life and actions is protected by being saved by Jesus. Christ's death does not just apply to me. It applies to all of us. And take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, Our weapon is the scripture, is the word of God. And I believe it creates something inside of us. When Jesus was tempted by Satan himself, how did he fight? With the words of God. It's for our forming. It is written that it is for our formation. Rich Velotis says this, the Bible is used for two things, a life oriented by the careful integration of God's truth and the victory already established in Jesus what have you oriented your life around? Maybe that's a good question for you to ponder today, to think about. What is it that you've oriented your life around? Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. I love this. The enemy is scared of those who discover who they are in Jesus. So just to sum it up, be aware of the spiritual battles. Be familiar with Satan's strategies. Don't let him kill your platform or steal your passion or destroy your purpose. Be skilled with the spiritual weapons that he has provided for us. Stay alert. Pray fervently. Get God's word into your soul. Live with purpose in every step. Be serious about your spiritual strength. What we're going to do right now, this is an opportunity For those of you maybe who have said, you know what, I realize that I'm in a battle right now. I never realized that there was a spiritual battle and I was kind of caught in the middle of it. There's an opportunity for you to start walking and following Jesus. There's an opportunity for you to experience freedom in Christ today. There's an opportunity for you. And when you battle, battles aren't over in one day. When you battle, it could take weeks. It could take months. We could be battling the rest of the time here on this planet. But what we know is we have someone that we serve and we follow that has already defeated and that will defeat the enemy. So I'm going to pray. And after I'm done praying, we're going to receive communion. And if this is your first time receiving communion, um, what communion is, for those of you who would say, "I'm I'm a follower of Jesus, It's a chance for you to be reminded that death has been defeated, that Jesus has paid the ultimate price for our salvation, that we have strength in who he is. And so as you receive that body or that bread represented as the body of Jesus, realize he broke his life for you. And when we receive the cup, the cup represents the blood that was shed, the sacrifice that had to be made for our lives. And maybe for some of you, you are not believers. You're not a follower of Christ. This table is open to you. This table is open to you. I'm going to pray. And as you, whenever you feel led, um, uh, Emerald's going to invite us to stand and we're going to sing together. But whenever you feel led, we're just going to simply um, make our way to the front. And then you're going to receive that on your own. If you want to go back to your chair and to receive that um, communion on your own. And remember, on this side, I believe... Uh, is the gluten-free option. There's a little little plate there and there's also the other option as well. Lord, we come to you today. We thank you so much. We thank you so much for helping us in this battle. 
And Lord, we know that we cannot fight it on our own. We can't even fight it on our, as a community, as a group, only because of your truth, only because of your words, only because of what you have done. And Lord, as we receive the truths that were shared today, Lord, let us be set free. Let us walk in your favor. Let us experience the goodness that only you can give to us. In your name.